Welcome to the Cold Case Christianity Broadcast, the only Christian case-making program hosted by a cold case homicide detective. J. Warner Wallace has been investigating cold case murders in Los Angeles County for over a decade. His work has been featured on Fox News, Court TV, and Dateline. For more information about Jim's work and the case for Christianity, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. Now, here's your host, J. Warner Wallace. Thanks for joining us at Cold Case Christianity. I'm Jay Warner Wallace. Um, we've been talking a little bit about how to apply some of the uh, investigative techniques that you might use in a cold case to the Bible and to the Christian scriptures in order to investigate whether Christianity is true and actually to maybe live differently as a result of taking an evidential approach toward your faith. Now, um, I've talked about this quite a bit in a book called Forensic Faith. Uh, and in this book, I talk about four attributes of first responders that I think translate well into the life of Christians. And that comes down to four, at, uh, four characteristics, four disciplines that uh, first responders typically engage in on a daily basis. Number one, we know our duty. Two, we, we train uh, for the, uh, um, the event that may be uh, right in front of us. We train daily for things we probably are never going to have to do. But just in case we do have to do them, we train for them. And then third, we learn how to investigate truth claims, even the claims of, let's say, if you're a medical first responder, how do you investigate what kind of condition you're, you're about to treat. If you're an investigative first responder, how do you know what happened at this crime scene? And then the fourth attribute, of course, is how do you communicate what you've learned as a result of your duty, training, and investigation to the world around you, either in a jury trial or maybe if you're a first responder and you show up at the hospital, what are you going to tell that doctor? These are just simple tools, simple skills uh, that we use as first responders that I think make us uh, better equipped to be in the world, but not of the world. In other words, we are always engaged in the culture around us, and we want to be engaged in that culture. As a matter of fact, they call us typically to rescue them and all uh, people in certain situations. That's why people in the general population call first responders. And and then, but at the same time, we have trained and have separated ourselves in such a way not to be an elitist, not to be somehow uh, unengaged, but so that we can better engage culture. So I thought about this as I was writing Forensic Faith, just to thought, well, can I at least help people see the skill set and apply the skill set to your Christian life? Also, I think it helps us to understand why it's so important to take an evidential approach to begin with. Now, we have been talking in recent episodes about uh, the, the skills that detectives use to investigate cases and how those skills might be applied to the Christian worldview, to the claims of Christianity typically made in the New Testament. And so today we're going to continue that by talking about how to add evidence to the case so to better know whether or not Christianity is true. And I'm talking about evidence that may not be found in the case book called the Bible, but maybe outside of the case book. And why should we even look at that? I'm going to tell you, that approach in and of itself can be somewhat controversial, even within believers in the church. This idea that you would ever test the claims of Scripture, shouldn't you presuppose that the claims of Scripture are true? This is God's Word, after all. And we are not to be testing God's, I'll hear this all the time, that we're not to be testing God's Word with the Word or ideas of man out here, either they're scientific ideas or they're studies that men might engage in. The Word of God is to reign supreme. Now, I will tell you that I, in many ways, agree with people who would make claims, at least on certain principles, that are like that. Here's what I mean. I would never deny that, that God is the first mover and is of primary importance and is the work of the Holy Spirit that is foundational and precedes anything that I do as a human. And so I would say that, look, I wasn't interested in making the case for Christianity or even looking at the evidence for Christianity until God first called me. I do believe that's true. That explains my own experience as, a, as a, an investigator who was not raised in the church, who ultimately looked at the Gospels for the first time at the age of 35. I did that because a switch was flipped, and I didn't flip it. God flipped that switch. And I was then suddenly interested and open, and I was willing to lay down my presuppositions. That is the work that the Holy Spirit has to do. I was not capable of doing that because of my base nature. I run from God. I deny God. I want to be God. <laughs> That is just the nature of all of us as fallen humans. So I would argue that, yes, there, I'm not saying that by adding to the case, by looking for evidence 
to, to support Christianity outside of Scripture. I don't mean that in any way to disparage the strength of Scripture. But my own personal experience has informed the way I approach this. Because as most of you know, I was an, an atheist, very committed at the age of 35, but I did have a, a, some believers in my family. I wasn't raised by Christians, but my dad remarried and his second wife was Mormon. And the only people I knew who ever lo- really took J- Jesus uh, seriously at all were, were Mormons. Yet I, I studied Mormonism pretty quickly and read through the Book of Mormon. And those claims, of course, those folks would tell you that you are not to test what the Book of Mormon says by looking outside of what the Book of Mormon says. You are just simply to read it and to ask God to confirm for you if the Book of Mormon is true. You're not to read beyond that and look at the history of Joseph Smith or the history of how he translated certain documents or even the history of archaeology uh, in those areas on the North American continent where Joseph Smith said the Book of Mormon took place. That is an affront to God, according to the missionaries that I talk to, the Mormon missionaries, who would tell me that the only way to honor God in examining whether or not the Book of Mormon is true is to simply read the book, to pray about it, and wait for a response without taking the additional step of adding to the case with external evidence from outside the Book of Mormon. Now look, most of you as Christians who are sitting here know that that, that's why people get confused about the Book of Mormon and would ever take it seriously, because if they ever investigated the claims of the Book of Mormon, they would know pretty quickly that they are false. Because once you look at the evidence outside of that, uh, those, uh, the scripture, the Mormon scripture, you, you recognize pretty quickly that it's not true. So what we're going to do in this episode is we are going to talk about how we add to the case for Christianity by examining evidence outside of Scripture. Now, you might think, well, okay, let me just tell you that also from my investigative experience as a cold case detective, that most of the time I pick up a case book and I I pull it out. It's one of those red case books that is unsolved murder. And I open that murder book and it has not been solved. It's 30 years old now. And it it doesn't, I, I can't solve it with what's in the case book. As a matter of fact, If it had been solvable, given what had been done already, the stuff that's been documented in the casebook, it wouldn't be an unsolved. It would have been uh, adjudicated years ago. Somebody would have gone to jail. Somebody would have got convicted years ago. But it didn't happen that way because whatever was in that casebook, it's just a little bit insufficient to make the case. You might even have a suspect who's been identified by the work in that casebook. But there's just something short of, uh, of a fileable case so I have, to, I know when I open that case book, I am going to have to look now for uh, new sources of evidence outside of what's in the case book I'm starting with to determine, to help a, a district attorney, for example, to see that this is a case that's worth filing. So my, all my work as an investigator, as a cold case investigator, is really about uh, looking outside of the case book for additional evidence that might help me determine if what's in the case book is true. And that's really the approach we're going to take this week when we talk about, well, is that a legitimate approach to Christianity? Look, I think it is. Because there are competing notions of Jesus out there in the Quran, in the Book of Mormon, in the Jehovah Witness Scripture. And of these different sets of Scripture that describe the person of Jesus, how are we to adjudicate? You could, every one of us, each of us could say, well, we're just going to presume that our Scripture is reliable and is the Holy Word of God, and therefore we're done. We, we begin with the presupposition that our Holy Scripture is telling us the truth. And guess what? That's not going to get you very far. At some point, we have to determine if these four books that say something about Jesus as Holy Scripture, yet they say opposite things about Jesus, which of these four is true? I think that's a fair reason to look outside of Scripture to see what we can learn to substantiate what's in these different pieces of Scripture. And that's what we're going to do. And we'll start right after the break. Be sure to download the free Cold Case Christianity app from the iTunes Store and the Android Marketplace. The Cold Case Christianity app puts all the resources from coldcasechristianity.com in the palm of your hand. You can read the daily blog, listen to podcasts, and watch videos from within the application. And Jim uses the app to send direct messages to fans of Cold Case Christianity. The app will also link you to all Cold Case Christianity social media and provide you with a direct connection to Jay Warner Wallace. Download the app today and become a better Christian casemaker.
Okay, now what I want to talk about in this first uh, segment of these two we're going to do here, uh, these two little breaks here we're going to take on this issue of adding to the case, adding to the evidence we have for a Christianity to see if it's true by looking at, at evidences outside of Scripture. Now look, what would be outside of Scripture that we could look at? Well, there, there, anytime I'm working with the case and somebody makes a claim and I've got it written down in an old case book from a supplemental report from 30 years ago where a witness has said, I saw X. Okay, fine. Now the question becomes, well, how do I determine if that is true, if that is reliable? Well, how you determine that is by looking at other sources of, of, of evidence that really corroborate these claims. That could be another eyewitness, by the way. Somebody else I find years later who can tell me something that might confirm details of that first eyewitness claim. Or it could be some piece of physical evidence. And so, for example, with the New Testament, I think there are several areas outside of Scripture we could look at. Archaeology would be one of those, right? The, we would look at other uh, uh, sources of information about the culture of Jerusalem in the first century, the culture of the areas around where the book of Acts took place in the first century, to see if the descriptions offered by Luke or any of the other gospel authors actually match what other people say about that region. We could even look for, to see if there are any sources outside of Scripture in which somebody writes something either about the early Christians or about Jesus himself or about the claims related to Jesus by the early Christians. These would all be, I think, valid ways of checking what it is that Scripture says uh, as early as we can. For example, if I just go back to the Book of Mormon, this is, these are claims that are made between 600 B.C. and 400 A.D. Is there any other ancient claims made on the North American continent that would in any way corroborate the ancient claims of the Book of Mormon? No, there aren't. And there are no archaeological claim, uh, evidences to support any of the claims of the Book of Mormon. But just the opposite is true with Christianity. So, for example, I talk about this in some presentations I've done online and in an article at coldcasechristianity.com. This is an article that has um, been posted and has about almost coming up on 400,000 reads. And it simply is an article entitled, Is There Any Evidence for Jesus Outside of the Bible, outside of the Scriptures, outside of the New Testament. And if you read that article, you will see everything that I'm about to discuss um, right now uh, in this little segment. So I'm not going to go through all the details, but let me just say this. If you were to read what non-Christians, including Jewish sources like Josephus, Thallus, Tacitus, Phlegon, Marabaras Serapion, um, there are several sources of ancient information about Jesus, and I limit those to within the life. So I want to make sure they had contact with people who were close to the life of Jesus. So I could find sources uh, for, um, in the second, third, fourth century that would continue to confirm the details. But that's pretty far removed in history. But all the ones I'm talking about are within the first hundred years. And so if you look at those sources, those are pretty close to the time of Jesus, you will be able to round out, to sketch out a profile of the person of Jesus. If you lost all of Scripture, all of Christian Scripture, and all you had were the authors that were either pagan, Greek, uh, uh, Syrian, uh, uh, Persian, and Jewish, uh, or Jewish authors as well. So pagan and Jewish authors like Josephus, uh, like Thallus, like Tacitus, like Phlegon, like Marabar or Ser Serapion. These are people that you can make a list, just um, excise out the details of those uh, that they, those authors are making about the person of Jesus. Look, this is not unusual when I work criminal cases that somebody will be willing to admit that they were at the scene of the crime but they will deny that they were involved in the crime. But the fact that they put themselves in the scene of the crime is kind of a reluctant admission that I am going to use in court because I'm gonna offer that, hey, they, they, they told you they were there and these witnesses saw they did these things. So, so we're gonna be able to use these reluctant admissions of people who would um, not admit to doing the crime but would give you enough detail that you could use in court. Uh, to make the case. Something similar happens here with the reluctant admissions of non-Christians, both pagan and Jewish, who are admit something, some detail about Jesus, but they won't, they, they're not believers, they won't give you the entire story of Jesus, but they will reluctantly have to admit certain details even in order to deny other claims. So the illustration I provided in Forensic Faith, I think kind of summarizes, and take a look at it. I'll leave it on the screen for a long time for you. What you'll see here in this diagram are some of the claims that are made by non-Christians about 
Jesus. Now, I'm going to leave it up on the screen so you can see that under each claim of Thallus and Tacitus and Bar and Marbar, Serapion and Phlegon, even Pliny the, Pliny the Younger, and I even put Suetonius and Celsus and Josephus in the Talmud, I'm giving you a range of, of, of non-Christian, pagan or Jewish sources outside of the casebook, outside of Scripture, and I'm just kind of cutting out what they say about the person of Jesus. And what you'll notice here is that if all you had was this information and no Jewish script, no uh, Christian scripture rather was available to you at all, look at that. That's a really in, that's a great um, collection of of of, of the scriptures of, of, of descriptors. In other words, you would know a lot about Jesus. Um, even without Christian scripture, that he lived, that he was crucified, that there was a darkness and earthquake at his crucifixion, that he was called the Christ, that his followers were called Christians, that he was executed under Pilate, and he was called a wise king, and the Jews were the ones who wanted him executed, and his teachings remained for years afterwards, that he was able to predict the future, and that he rose after death and showed signs of his crucifixion, and that his followers thought he not only rose from the grave, but that he was God incarnate, and that he was you know a real man called the Christ and, and this Jewish disturbance that occurred afterwards that ultimately may have even led to the destruction of the temple. A lot of that destruction, that, that disturbance was a cause of Jesus, was a cause of that, and that he was allegedly born of a virgin and his father was a, allegedly a carpenter and he had miraculous power and he was wise and his followers reported the resurrection. These are all things that are found, not in, in Christian scripture, but in non-Christian and Jewish scripture, not scripture, but uh, writings like Josephus. So I think you've got enough detail here outside that you can feel confident that the Christian witnesses have been corroborated. Again, this is not to, to say we have to test or we should test or we shouldn't trust what's been in this, but at least now you know when, uh, when different versions of, of scripture from one world religion or another make claims about Jesus, this would be a valid way, I think, to be able to test those claims because we looked for evidence outside of the case book. Now, I'll take one more quick break and I'll show you how we can do the same thing with the evidence for God's existence. Jim, as a once angry atheist, something about the Gospels struck you as being more than, and I quote you, moralistic mythologies. They actually appeared to be ancient eyewitness accounts and that, that very fact became important to you. Why? I think because when I first started, I was just interested in Jesus' words. So if it had been just a list, like the Gospel of Thomas, a list of the quotes of Jesus, the kind of proverbial wisdom of Jesus, that would be one kind of document. But of course, the Gospels aren't that at all. The Gospels appear to be recording a series of events that include Jesus' words, but these appear to be a historical account. And that's a very different proposal altogether. That means that if it is history, if it's a claim about something that actually happened, it means it's falsifiable. In other words, it's like my cold cases. I have people who will say, hey, I saw this, this is what happened, and they give me a narrative. Well, I can actually go in and take a look and see if that's reliable. Is that true? Did it actually happen? Is it falsifiable? And that gives me a point of context, a point of reference to begin an investigation. You'd have a hard time doing that if, for example, all we have is the Gospel of Thomas, a series of proverbial statements for the most part from Jesus. We'd have a really hard time uh, even doing any kind of an historical investigation to see if it actually occurred. But these don't have that kind of contextual feeling. As I read through them, I saw they had properties that were similar to the properties of eyewitnesses when you have more than witness, one witness to see in an event. When you have multiple eyewitness accounts, they have a certain characteristic, a certain flavor. And at first, as I read, read through these, I didn't really put my finger on what it was about them I have in the book, but for me, it just my gut instinct as an investigator said, wow, that's interesting. I've seen that before in, in a robbery. I've seen that before in a homicide account. So I, 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 it just caused me to take the next step. I think we're blessed as Christians that we don't believe something that's not rooted in history. We believe something that had to actually occur. As Paul said, if the resurrection didn't actually occur, occur in history, we're to be pitied. We're, they're lying as eyewitnesses, he says. We're, we're a lie. It's all a lie. And that's the beautiful thing about Christianity is it's something you can actually investigate. I'm grateful for that because as an investigator, that's exactly how I came to faith. Okay, now clearly our scripture makes claims about the existence of God, right? I mean, it starts right in Genesis 1, the very first lines, that God is the creator of everything in the universe and he created everything from nothing. So the very first claims of Jewish scripture and of course then of, uh, look at John, the first chapter of John. It's clear that we could learn a lot and make a claim about the existence of God by staying inside the casebook of both the Old and the New Testament. 
But of course, we could also step outside to look at the evidence in the world to see if, in fact, we could make claims and deduce certain truths about a divine creator from what we see outside of Scripture. And, and if you look at this, I wrote about this, that the, all the stuff I talked about in the last segment is all about the truth of Christianity. You'll find that information in Cold Case Christianity and in Forensic Faith. But what we're talking about here is the evidence that I describe in a book called God's Crime Scene, where I step outside of Scripture. And in this book, God's Crime Scene, I think only in one chapter do I mention just a few lines of Scripture, because I wanted to show... If you're someone like me, who's an atheist who didn't really trust what Scripture has to say about anything, I didn't, I could actually make a case, and a case could be made to me from the evidence outside of Scripture that describes, in fact, the God Yahweh that we see represented inside of Scripture. That is in uh, God's crime scene. Now, here's what I did. I said, okay, look, if we looked outside of Scripture and just looked at the evidence that's in the universe, eight pieces of evidence, the beginning of the universe, the fine-tuning of the universe, the origin of life in the universe, the appearance of design and biology, the existence of mind and consciousness, and free agency as a result of mind and consciousness, and objective, transcendent moral truths, and the problem of evil, the idea that we have to have a standard, an objective, transcendent standard of good by which we can judge anything to be evil. Okay, I just gave you really quickly eight pieces of evidence that I could look at without ever touching Scripture. I could add to the case that's made in Scripture by collecting evidences outside the case book, the same way I do in my cold cases. And I will show you a diagram here that actually illustrates this. This is from Forensic Faith. And so here you can see that we've got um, a diagram that really shows the eight pieces of evidence I just described and how those eight pieces of evidence are best explained by that being, that deity, uh, that is described in Scripture. In other words, you could, just without touching Scripture, uh, make a case that there is something out there that's responsible for all space, time, matter, and everything in the universe, and you could develop a suspect profile. And guess what? If you did that, it would look a lot like the God of the New Testament, the God of the Old Testament. And in fact, now we've been able to assemble a case for God's existence from evidence that's outside the casebook. Now, that shouldn't surprise us that what we see inside the casebook of the Bible accurately describes everything that we find outside the casebook. If I have the right suspect in one of my crimes, well, then everything I find years later should line up, should also point to that suspect as the right suspect in my case, right? I mean, that's if I have the wrong suspect, I'm going to find things that will actually show me years later I had the wrong guy all along. So it shouldn't surprise us that the stuff we see in the casebook of Christianity, inside the New and Old Testament, actually makes sense of reality. It, it actually makes sense of what we see outside the casebook. That shouldn't surprise us. And that is, in fact, what happens. And this is why we would say that we can learn something about God in two ways, in two ways that are described in Scripture. The first is that you could um, learn a lot about God, and no one's got an excuse. As here's the diagram from Forensic Faith. This kind of shows the two ways we know anything about God through special revelation and natural revelation. We can know a lot about God, and no one's got an excuse, because what's not, what could be seen about God is clear. We see this in Romans 1, where Paul says that no one has an excuse, because everything uh, in creation uh, screams about the Creator. And so we all should, should know, just from what we see in nature around us, um, that 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 God exists. And then, of course, the details of who that God is and the nature of that God, you may not be able to get those from, from creation. The kind of specifics and the details are require special revelation, and that's what we see inside of Scripture. Interestingly here, you can see from this diagram that both of these point to the same creative divine being who's unchanging. And so that means that whatever we see in the natural world ought to make sense of what we see in Scripture. It's always a wrestling match, right, between trying to figure out how these two things work together. Now, I never want to let what I think uh, be imposed upon what God is saying in Scripture. So I'm always very, trying to be very, and I always, personally, I'm always going to default towards Scripture. But again, part of the question is what does this scripture really mean? And there are some areas where it, it, there seems to be some latitude about how you or I might interpret certain passages. And so I've got to figure out which of my, these possible interpretations is, is really 
what we would say hermeneutically sound. In other words, it doesn't torture the text, that it actually makes sense. We're trying to figure out what did the author in his context have in mind for the reader in the reader's context. So, for example, I'm not going to read Psalms woodenly when it says that God has the wings of a bird or the feathers of a bird. I know that's going to be a certain genre of, 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 of literature in the scripture that I am to read one way as opposed to a history that I am to read another way. So, so I get it. This is the wrestling match. What I am uncomfortable with sometimes is that one side of the debate, whether you interpret a passage one way, then you've got a brother over there who's also a Christian interprets it a different way, and both are doing their best to let, let the, the primacy of scripture uh, speak for itself. I just want to be good interpreters of what it is Scripture is saying. And then we'll fight with each other about how we've interpreted it and even divide from one another about how we've interpreted it. I try not to divide over non-essentials. But I do want the, the special revelation of Scripture to, to inform what I see in natural revelation and vice versa. Because these two things have been given to me by God. It's not that I have the, 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 the words and work of men on one side and the word and work of God on the other. What I have are two, two works of God, two creative aspects of God's nature that have been expressed through natural revelation and special revelation. I don't see as it as man's words competing with God's word. It is God's word being interpreted through God's creation, God's creation being interpreted through man's word, or the God's word. And it's about trying to figure out which of these two, both of which come from God makes the best sense. And this is a struggle. And I will always say this before I sign out for today. I almost always never make a claim in front of a jury about how I think the suspect did it. I simply want to demonstrate that the suspect did it. I might be wrong on certain details about how he did it because he hasn't confessed to me and I don't know all those details, but I have more than enough evidence that he did it. The same is true here. We have more than enough evidence that God created everything. How precisely he did it, I don't know. And we'll find that out when God tells us uh, when we are finally united to him. I hope that kind of helps you though about thinking about adding to the case adding to what's outside the casebook to have a better understanding of what's written in the casebook. And I'll see you right back here next week at Cold Case Christianity. Thanks for joining us at the Cold Case Christianity broadcast. If you're interested in more information about this week's topic, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. For a thorough investigation of the reliability of the New Testament Gospels in the case for Christianity, be sure to purchase Cold Case Christianity, a homicide detective investigates the claims of the Gospels. It's available wherever books are sold.